for being here this morning. I want to get started just because I know last week we ran over, there's so much to talk about and I want to make sure we have enough time. Um, we are switching the order. We've been, we were, we, this week we were going to talk about re-entry um, because of some scheduling issues with the people that are speaking. This week they're going to talk about hope and how we can um, discern together how we might partner. Next week we'll have people here to talk about re-entry. Um, but I do, first I want to quickly have an uh, announcement. Linda McCorkle, based on our discussion last week and the concern some of you raised about the prison system, because um, the people that we heard from, we do have a GCC action coming up, and so it seemed very timely. So Linda has, will tell us a little bit about that. Thank you. <laughs> As Jeannie mentioned, at last week's Edwin's Town Hall on Life in Prison, many St. Paul's members expressed concern about how we might work for changes in the criminal justice system. Through Greater Cleveland Congregations, our church has been actively involved in advocating for a more responsive criminal justice system. In February, over 1,000 GCC members gathered at Fairmount Temple for a forum with candidates for county prosecutor and highlighted our concerns about racial disparity in incarceration and the need for treatment alternatives for low-level drug offenses instead of sentencing people to prison. On Thursday, November 17, GCC is holding an action entitled, Now is the Time, Justice and Jobs in Greater Cleveland. The agenda for this action includes holding the prosecutor-elect accountable to the commitments he made to GCC at our action in February, plus new issues that have emerged in meetings with him over the summer. These include crisis intervention facilities to treat the mentally ill instead of jailing them, an independent prosecutor for cases involving lethal force by a police officer, a reduction in overcharging low-level nonviolent offenders, and building a civil rights division in the prosecutor's office. We hope to have a large number of St. Paul members attend this action at Olivet Institutional Baptist Church. If you are interested in attending, I hope you will sign up today during this town hall presentation. If you have further questions, I will be here through after the 1115 service. Thank you. Linda, repeat the time and the date again, please. It will be Thursday, November 17th at 7 p.m., arriving at 6.30. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. It's starting to become easy getting up early and uh, coming to St. Paul's. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you again for making it again. Um, you know, packed house and um, you know, really appreciative for um, for all those of you who've been dining this week. I tell you, every day this week, someone said, "I'm from St. Paul's. I'm from St. Paul's." So you, you've been filling up the seats uh, here as well as at the restaurant, and we couldn't be more thankful. Uh, that today's program again, we're trying to squeeze this in by 11 o'clock because I know there's another service at 11. Some of you go to, and, and some of you get hungry. So 11 o'clock, we're trying to squeeze things in by. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep it short. We made an adjustment this week. We were going to talk about you know, housing and these other barriers uh, that happen uh, when, when returning home. And, and the, the expert in this uh, and couldn't make it this week, and Sister Rita could, who, who's an expert in, in really delivering hope. So that's, that's today's agenda, hope. Uh, you know, what can we do to, um, to help others that are returning home? What can we do for others that are, that are experiencing these difficulties? As you heard from some of the speakers last week, and how can we jump face first right in and, and start making a difference? Uh, you know, quickly, the, um, you know, the, the whole idea behind Edwin's, you know, people say, what do you do? I say, well, we, you know, we deliver hope. That's what we do. 
Uh, we, we show someone that there's a different path to, to, to going somewhere, and not only do we give someone a goal, we also help them with guidance. Uh, but it, all, all it takes is um, a little hard work, I like to say. So uh, today, Sister Rita will talk to you about the hard work she's been doing inside the prisons uh, with, with families of those who are incarcerated, uh, for those who have been incarcerated, and she can tell you of many ways to get involved. Uh, but just don't forget, it just takes that one person or that one idea or that one action to, to really make something happen. I think what it, it was Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, the boss, you know, he said, it takes a spark to start a fire, right? <laughs> you can't start a fire, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's it, you need a spark. And so um, hopefully, sister, uh, you have a spark today. Thank you. Much. It's really uh, a privilege and a, priv uh, a real wonderful experience for uh, me to be able to be here with you this morning. I um, worshipped with the community this morning at 8 o'clock at um, St. Agnes Our Lady of Fatima over on Lexington. And we closed um, the, the liturgy with the song, I've got joy, 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 joy deep in my heart. And Truly, I feel that so much as I'm with you uh, this morning. Um, I think that as I reflect on incarceration and being in prison, one thing that brings me tremendous hope is a quotation from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 25. I was in prison when you came. What more can we say? Um, I was in prison, and you came. How much it means to all of us to be accompanied, to be with another who cares. I think that Pope Francis, and I don't know if you have followed any of the things that he says, but the day after he was elected Pope, he spoke to thousands and thousands at St. Peter's, and he said, it's good for us to have the doors of the church open so that people can come in. That's what we want. We want people to be able to come and feel at home and feel comfortable and know that they're loved. But what's very important is that the doors stay open so that you can go out. Go out to the places where the people are. Go out to the favelas. Go out to the margins. Go there and be with the people, and then come back smelling like the sheep. Isn't that a great image? Who of us wants to smell like a sheep? Very true, isn't it? But he said, when you are there, when you gaze into the eyes of those who are there on the margins, in the favelas, I say, in the prison cells, you will be gazing into the eyes of Christ. What a powerful experience. And I believe that that's at the heart of what we're going to be talking about this morning. Currently, there are 2.3, and I heard yesterday, 2.7 million people incarcerated in the United States. We represent 5% of the global population of the world. But we represent 25% of those who are incarcerated. Isn't that shocking? Here we are in the United States with 25% of the people in the world who are in prison in our prisons. We have the largest prison population in the whole world. We have 4,575 prisons in the United States, four times the number of Russia, which comes in second. A recent study done by the ACLU says, Ohio has a mass incarceration crisis. 
There are currently 50,600 people incarcerated in the, the state of Ohio. When I began this ministry for the Diocese of Cleveland, there were 44,000. Our prisons are built to house 38,600 people, and at the present time, we have 12,000 people more than we're able to accommodate. The report went on to say that beyond these inhumane numbers, there is a fundamental misuse, and, and patients and I were just talking about that, of criminal justice tools to attack social and health issues in our community. We've responded to poverty, <coughs> to drug and alcohol addiction, to mental health illness, and an overall lack of opportunities with punishment. That meeting that's coming up is going to address some of that. I hope many of you will be there. Instead of treating people with mental illness, we criminalize them and block access to the care that they need. Really, I'm sure you must realize this, that the mental health needs of those who are incarcerated and the addiction needs of those who are incarcerated and the poverty and the lack of education so evident in those who are incarcerated are not able to be met by our criminal justice system. And so people spend time there and then they're released. And the basic issue has not been addressed. Those who try then to re-enter society have the door slammed on them. They have a record. Oftentimes their difficulties have not been addressed. And so they're shut out by mounting collateral sanctions that prevent them from getting a job, finding a place to live, having reliable uh, transportation, and so much more. The result is that we have a system that's costing our state in every sense of that word. Ohio has the sixth largest prison population in the nation. In the last decade, the prison population has increased 12%, despite the fact that the violent crime rate has been reduced to a 30-year low. In 2014, taxpayers spent over $1.7 billion to operate the state system of prisons. $32,000 per inmate. Every dollar spent on prisons is a dollar that's not spent on crime and survivors, on schools, on addiction, on mental health, and other services that enrich our community. Now, Brandon said I was going to talk about hope. <laughs> Great introduction. That's all right. <laughs> but that's just the hard news, isn't it? That is the side that says we are a people of hope. We are people who believe in a gospel of hope. We are people who know so well the words of Mark chapter 25. I was in prison and you came. And so I want to stop briefly and talk just a little bit about what has been my experience over the past 20 years now. I began working in the Diocese of Cleveland in the year 2000, or 1995. I just cut off five years. <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but I did. And um, I'm on the bishop's staff as the secretary for parish life and development. That means I have responsibility for the parishes of the Diocese of Cleveland. But in addition to that, I also am working with eight offices within my area of responsibility. And over the course of the years, I found, and you know this well, that in your parishes, and in your church, 
All life happens, doesn't it? Everything connects to our faith. And so that realization was really challenged for me in 1996 when Bishop Quinn, who was an auxiliary bishop, came and asked me, I was at a meeting with um, about 12 gentlemen, I was the only woman in the room, and we heard of the need for a formal prison ministry for the diocese, and we didn't have it at that time. So it was a wonderful presentation. I thought, wow, this is really important. We need to do this. And so about five weeks later, I met the bishop, and I said, I hope somebody offered to take that ministry on. And he said, no, as a matter of fact, nobody did. I said, that's too bad, because it's really important. And he said to me, no, it is. I'm glad you heard that. I said, I did. It's really, I, I hope somebody will do it. And he said to me, well, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I said to him, oh, Bishop, I've got a full-time job. I'm responsible for all the parishes. He said to me, well, where do you think the people come from? <coughs> really good point. He got me. I said, but I don't know anything about prison ministry. I don't know anything about prisons. He said, well, you can learn. Get a committee together. Surround yourself with people who do know, who've had the experience. And out of that, the prison ministry has grown. Right now, we have a presence in every one of the jails, the county jails, and in the state prisons of the eight county diocese. And we have about 400 people who go into the jails and the prisons, a presence there at least one day a week, and in some of them, three or four days a week. All people who heard that call, I was in prison and he came. About six years ago, we had a new director for the Ohio prison system appointed. His name is Gary Moore. Gary had had some experience in prisons, well, definitely experience in prisons. He had been a warden and had retired. The governor called him back out of retirement to take on the responsibility for the prisons of the state. And um, he said something right in the very beginning. He said that his emphasis would be on reentry. And that if Ohio ever built another prison, he would resign. He's held to that promise. About four years ago, I attended the first summit on reentry. It was a faith summit, and it was held at the Northeast Reintegration Center. And at that time, he outlined a plan of participation and partnership between the prison system and the broader community. It was a very exciting meeting. One of the things that he said that really struck me <clears throat> is that the two influences for in assisting persons coming out of incarceration of assisting persons who are incarcerated, the two greatest influences are the family and the church. Faith and family. And so what he was asking us, representatives of the various faith congregations, was to get involved in the prisons. That, to me, was my mind. I had struggled up until that point, to try and figure out ways to get these 400 volunteers that I had into the institution. And believe me, that's no easy thing to do. Here he was, inviting us to be a part. And so I want to talk a little bit about what has happened since then. Up until that point, we were going into the prisons and the jails for the purpose of religious services, which we have continued to do. And so we have uh, Catholic Mass uh, celebrated in all the prisons and the jails at least once a week, and in the Cuyahoga County Jail at least three to four times a week. Beyond that, however, and I want to say this very clearly, anything that we are doing in the jails and the prisons is open to everyone regardless of faith. 
everyone is welcome. We are there at the county jail for all 2,300 people. And so, um, what have we been doing? Well, certainly the religious services. The services, Bible study, book discussions, one-on-one -on -one opportunities for people to talk, and I want to come back and tell you just one story about that. In addition to that, across the board, we have expanded our program. I was telling patients about a gentleman from PNC who called me the other day. He wants to teach financial planning in the prison. Great. He said, teacher, he said, I've got the whole curriculum. I said, well, you realize that for some who will be in your classes, you want to start with how do you open a bank account and how do you write a check? He said, I got it. So he will be going in once a week to teach classes. In addition to that, however, um, we've established a GED program in many of the uh, prisons or supplemented an existing GED program. We're doing tutoring in reading and in math. You would be amazed at the number of people who can't read. Did you ever think about your life, what it would be if you couldn't pick up a book and read? Do you know what it does to you, to your sense of yourself and your dignity? There was a man they were talking about the other day uh, who is on death row in one of the state institutions, not Ohio. He couldn't read. It took him 18 years to teach himself how to read. And he said, I'll never forget the day that a letter came from his mother and he picked it up and realized that she too could not read. She sent him letters with just scrolls of amazing, isn't it? And amazing, the world that's opened up when I sit and teach you how to read, or how to do a simple math program, or how to balance your checkbook. Or we have other classes. We have the biggest loser program in the Lorraine Correctional Institution. We lost the most weight in the whole state of Ohio. <laughs> Boy, were they proud, let me tell you. They changed the diet at the prison. Those men who were participating got some alterations made in the diet. Poetry classes, um, creative writing, drama, computer classes, interviewing skills, arts, crafts, music, parenting skills, finances. Really just about anything you can think of that will enrich the life of another and prepare that person to go back out to the community. I believe that was a dream of Gary Moore. What it says to the people is that there are people who care about you, who care about your family, and who care about your future. I have one very funny story, and I'm going to go through this fast, but we were trying to prepare backpacks for people who were leaving the county jail. Many people go out to the street with nothing but the prison clothes or the, what they were wearing when they came in. We've adjusted that a little bit. But they go out with nothing. So I thought what we could do is make backpacks. That would be great. So we made backpacks with soap, toilet paper, Kleenex, washcloths, etc., etc. The things that you need just to live. And we were passing them out to the indigent as they left. So one Monday was a holiday. I still needed a few things for the backpack, so I went to the dollar store in my neighborhood. I live on the near west side on 65th Street. And <clears throat> so I was taking. 200 packs of Kleenex, 200 packs of handy wipes, 200 of something else, 200 something else, and I got to the checkout counter, piled it up all on the counter, and the lady said to me, is this all for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I said, I don't have a cold, and um, I don't need that many handy wipes. She, she said, but what is it for? I said, and I don't usually do this. I said, oh, we're making backpacks for the people that are leaving the jail. And she said, for the women too? And I said, yeah, of course. If the women are leaving, leaving and need something in. She said, well, you know, I was there. 
I said, you were. Did you work at the jail? No, she said, I was an inmate. And she said, when I was there, I was so scared. She said, I was shaking. And I wrote a kite, which is what you write when you need something. A little pink paper. I wrote a kite, and I said, could someone come and talk to me? And she said, a lady came. And she said, she sat down next to me. And for 45 minutes, she just listened to me. Nobody's ever listened to me in my whole life. And she said then she came back every week and she listened to me. She said to me, are you from the Catholic ministry? I said, yeah, I am. And she said, I thought so. She said, I want you to know you guys saved my life. She said, I've been out for 24 months and I'm clean. I go regularly to my meetings. I have three children and I've gotten two of them back. I'm engaged to be married. I'm going to put a down payment on the house and I've got a job. You guys saved me. What more? What more? Tremendous hope. So there are many other things I think that can be done, but I want to move on. Um, I want to talk about letter writing. I started um, to write to a man. I write to many people who are in prison. I think it's important. But one day I came into work and there was a man sitting on the step near my office and he said to me, are you Sister Rita? And I said, yeah, I am. And um, I said, but I don't recognize you. He said, well, you know me. I said, I do? He said, yes, you've written to me for five years. He said, I want you to know yours are the only letters I ever got. I was amazed. I said, the only letter you ever got? Oh my gosh, I felt so guilty. I thought I should have written longer letters. <laughs> I should have written more often. He said, you'll never know what that meant to me. Such a simple thing as writing a letter. I got a letter from a man the other day who was pleading for somebody to, walk, to write to him. Two days later, a man called me. He said, you know, I've been thinking about, there's been a notice in my bulletin. It belongs to Our Lady of Peace about being eight people to write letters. I'd love to do that. He said, I'm 83 years old, but I'd love to do that. He said, I'm going to send you a letter today. I'll put it in the mail before I leave. They're corresponding. It's incredible. Birthday cards. One man spoke the other day at a workshop we had. He was on death row for 39 years. He was exonerated because of an 11-year-old boy who had testified that he, his brother, and a friend had killed a man. It wasn't true. That man now is older, so he stepped up here in Cleveland and went to the court and said, I lied. They didn't. I didn't see them kill him. I was nowhere near there. Those men had been released, exonerated. That man at the workshop that we had, which took place out of St. John Vianney in Mentor, he said, I was on death row for 39 years. And one day, he said, a letter came under my door, a card. He said it was uh, an Easter card from the Catholic, Catholic women from, I don't, I think they were from St. Mary's in Worcester, who do that regularly. He said it changed my whole life. Very simple. And so, um, that's one area. But the other area, and I put flyers at the back at the table, is the LEAF Ministry, which we established two years ago. It stands for listening, encouraging, affirming, or assisting families of the incarcerated. I remember hearing when we first made the outline of the ministry to the incarcerated. I remember hearing that when a loved one goes to prison, the whole family goes. And if I believe that in the past, there is no comparison to what I know today. It, those are incredible stories. What happens to a family when a loved one goes? And shouldn't we be there for them? And so we've begun a ministry. We now have 11 groups across the eight counties of the diocese who meet once a month 
in order to come together for support and encouragement and assistance. And so that is another area where I believe there is a call to give hope. And so finally, I'd like to talk just a little bit about Edwin's. And I'm going to do that from a personal story, which even Brandon doesn't really fully realize. I have, somehow we came together, I have been inspired by Edwin's and what is being done. I think that is a miracle on Shaker Square. To realize what is happening in the lives of people who have spent time in prison and can come on with beginnings of skills, some of them, not all, and go to a place like Edwin's, be able to be educated, find a community who are there to support and encourage them, give them the skills, not only technical working skills, but life skills that will carry them into the future, mentor them along the way as they work and as they leave, have, I believe, it's a 98% employment rate. The skills and the confidence and the buildup that will prevent them from ever going back into a prison is astounding. Now I want to tell you a little story. I'm a teacher. That's my background. I live with a community of sisters who are teachers over at Metro Catholic Parish School on the west side of Cleveland. 600 inner city kids. There was a young boy in that school, um, came from a Hispanic family, a good family. He went all the way through school. He went on and graduated from high school. He went on and attended John Carroll University. In his senior year, the last semester, he did something very foolish and ended up being sent to prison. He was the first one in his family to ever go to college. A wonderful young man. He came out and he went to Edwards. And he was in one of their last graduating classes. When I saw his name on that list, I cried. Life has opened up for him again. There's hope. And so that's what this is all about. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sister. Well, Sister, that song, what song were you singing at the end of the service, Joy, Joy, Joy? I still like the boss's song better. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, uh, speaking next, uh, there's, there's two of our, our star students here. Um, Lee Porter uh, is the first one to speak. You, you may have seen him on Harry Boomer's show. We went on air a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just a wonderful man. He, he tells, um, you know, he, he doesn't pull any punches. He tells a story, and uh, he's here to share uh, that with you today. So Lee, it's all yours. some type of rebellion against our parents or whatnot. So um, I dealt with that a little bit, and because of that, I ended up in prison. Um, it was it was really bad, the initial experience of going to prison. I think, you know, once, it's like a bomb. When a bomb detonates, it's not really like, that's tragic in itself, but I think the real tragedy is in the aftermath, you know, because you're constantly dealing with the reverberations of 
you know, that, that impactful thing. So right now I've been dealing with it and it's, it's kind of weird to be here at this age and dealing with something that you did, you know, from as a child, as a kid. But this is my opportunity now to change it around. And like Sister Rita was just um, illustrating pretty much, it's like I don't have um, the necessary, uh, we gain tools and we gain life skills at, at Evans. You know, we get, we get the opportunity and the, the tools to go further and to, you know, to come out of the uh, the cycle we were in to get us in jail in the first place. Um, it's not just technical, but it's very, very difficult, the program we are in, but it's not just technical. Like she said, there's a support system around, um, even with you guys here, you know, so opportunity, it's a pleasure to come up here and be able to share my story and speak with you guys about what we're doing here. Initially, I was under the impression that I was just going to a culinary school, and Right, and so um, I didn't know that you know I had this this community, this support system. You know, and everyone is just like it's a beautiful thing, and it, it just uh, reinforces the, you know what I want to do and where I should go and what direction I should take. And I look forward to that, and I appreciate everything that this, this program has offered. Um, I'm here. I'm standing in front of you guys. I haven't. I don't have any, I haven't had any education as far as speaking, as far as this goes. I haven't had any, you know, uh, anything to prepare me for this. So I am thankful though, and I am, I appreciate everything that's um, taken place thus far. Uh, uh, please forgive me, I haven't had uh, the opportunity to prepare a speech. I don't think I should prepare you know, I have some wrote down what I'm going to say because I like to speak from the heart and, you know, as, as it's been touching me as well. So I apologize for, you know. Q&A until afterwards, so um, you, you guys can tease it out of Lee and uh, have fun. Okay, um, and, and, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Latina. Uh, Latina, we just had a blast. We went to uh, more of LA. Went to LA a week ago. There's a show. Have you ever heard of T.D. Jakes? Yeah, so T.D. Jakes calls us on Tuesday. Is it, is it, can you come out on Thursday? Is it Thursday in October? And he, or actually, this is two weeks ago. He'll go, this, this Thursday. I said, geez, man, what are you doing? So I said, Latina. You want, you want to go to Hollywood? When she said, of course, let's get out of this <laughs> Let's get out of this place. So uh, I just had a wonderful time uh, you know, bonding and, and, and talking uh, with Latina. So I, I thought this would just be a great fit today. Um, yeah, just a wonderful perspective. And uh, you know, there's, no, there's, there's no one more real to talk to, I don't think, than you, than you Latina. Um, so it was a very enjoyable trip. If we ever travel again, you're coming along and, and we'll do it. OK, so here's Latina. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Latina. Um, let me see, I'm a mother of one, a grandmother of four. I was incarcerated a while ago. I got myself together, but I was going to the community college for cooking. I love to cook. You can't tell how skinny I am, but I do love to cook and I love to eat. So I racked up 30 grand in school loans and bills and still owe them, but I've never seen the stove yet. Ain't seen the stove. Got over there with Brandon. I done cooked already. I done did a whole bunch of things. Again, I went to LA. I mean, who could say they did that? I can't. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, he does a lot. I had a picnic for the holiday. And I'm like, okay, where can I, where can I get some umbrellas from? It's gonna be a rainy day. He said, we're gonna take them out the basement. I said, take them out the basement? I can't even afford them. He said, no, you can go and use them. I'm like, oh, I like you already. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, I've, I've experienced a lot in this program. Like the um, Sister Mary said, they help you get your bank accounts together. 
I, I have not had a bank account in over 14 years. My crown was messing with them banks, so I never thought to go back and ask them, can I actually get a bank account? <laughs> so with Brandon, I have a bank account. I mean, I have a lot of things to look forward to. I want to go and finish up the school, and I want to go on a cruise to be a chef on the cruise for a little while, but I want to open up my own food truck. So if y'all see Linda Soul Food flying around, stop me and I will give you something to eat. And that's about all I have. So we'll just do Q and A up, up until the time everyone has to uh, has to boogie. Uh, you know, the, the follow-up for today is uh, Sister Rita. She has flyers. There's plenty of ways to get involved. Um, you know, again, please ask questions. It was so nice to have you again here this this, this morning, and um, and really thankful. Like, I'm going to just mimic what Lee said. Just just thankful. Uh, thankful for you know, this much energy. And I see some you know some teenagers in the crowd. Last time they were up there. And uh, it's just it's just wonderful to see you know so much life behind um, you know something so uh, so special. So uh, Q and A, have at it. Just wondering, Lee, how long were you in prison? I I was in prison for three years, but actually I'm kind of still in prison um, because I'm dealing with the you know the aftermath I was explaining about. It's kind of like. You think when you release from prison that is that's would be the end all to everything you went through, but at the same time, I think um, you're dealing with a lot of other things that can derail you and keep you from having a productive life. So, in a sense, it's kind of like you're still in that cell, but you're free. But if you're mentally, you're still locked up. But and that could be a huge problem. So, right now, I've been. Uh, I've been coming out. I've been free for at least I've been four months. I've been in the program now. I mean, so yeah, I'm in a different place now. So thanks. Sometimes, you know, just like with transportation, with, you know, getting back and forth to work, with just little small things that, you know, that you don't think is really big, but you, it means a lot. I, um, just like with the Life School Center, or with school, you know, just with, just going to Edwards, I'm in the, I, I live in the dorms, so that alleviates the travel to work, you know, the bills and all the other things that, you know, that becomes a, a burden to a lot of us, to everyone really that's, you know, that's just part of life, but it, it alleviates all that, that pressure. So it gives you the opportunity to, you know, expand and grow a little bit. You don't have to worry about those things. They erase all those things that you, you know, might want to deal with. So it, it doesn't derail you. It keeps you on, it keeps us all on the path and it allows us to, you know, to successfully complete our program. Oh, well, I did. For me, I've been, it's been a long time since I've been out the penitentiary, so I don't quite remember that part. <laughs> it's, I've been in on the spray mirror, so I don't have to worry about that one. If you guys could add something to what's available now for the veterans, what areas do you think you want to see more of? I would think. Go <laughs> ahead. Make sure you get the question. Um, what areas? Could you repeat that? Or, what areas would you like to see more of? Well, I would think the area, the things that that would help us, will probably be a little maybe um, because they have everything mapped out. I mean, it's very meticulous and it's you know it's, it's very well thought out. I would think maybe would be uh, probably like recovery services or some form, and you know, with even with the faith 
base. You know, we have a lot of churches who come in and, and speak. We go to some places like that. And, but this is my first time here, and I, I welcome the opportunity, as I said before. And I really appreciate, you know, the opportunity to come here and speak. But, yeah, I think it's all well thought out, pretty meticulous. And, but I think what um, one area could be probably is uh, uh, maybe recovery services or something, some form or fashion. Um, I don't know if Brenda got it all mapped out. I mean, he, he thought he crossed every T and dot every I. I don't think there's nothing more you can add to it. Everyone here wants to help out one way. What would you, I mean, what would, what would you say? Ooh. I had to think on that one. Sir, have you been able to register to vote since you were released from prison? Yeah, I registered uh, immediately once I got out of prison. See, that's the one thing I had uh, decided when I was locked up. I was, you know, it's a bad situation, but I was, I could make it worse if I didn't educate myself. So I tried to do everything I could to um, prepare myself to come back out, to, you know. But a lot of times, uh, you don't really get that opportunity. You get distracted, you get caught up in a lot of things that, you know, that's not necessarily conducive to where you want to be. But yeah, so I, uh, I registered to vote. And I've been voting for, I would say, probably like, probably nine years now, ten years. And I've been voting every year since I've been released, so about 14 years. And you have to remember, Hillary Clinton's campaign office is right across the street. So we get right we on one knock a day. Is that what we're was what are we doing in order to help the mental health issues. We're, much of our work is within the institution. So um, we are offering a number of um, courses that help people to build up their sense of worth and their sense of confidence. We also have bereavement people who are dealing with tremendous grief. We've got uh, bereavement groups that are very, very helpful. Um, we have people who are going in, like so many of you, you've got skills. You have wonderful skills. And, um, you know, what I find is that there are a number of people who are prison ministry volunteers who have retired, but they've got this wonderful bank of skills to share. And so some of those are social workers, counselors. We can't set up a mental health program that's within the prison responsibility, but we can provide opportunities that contribute to a person's mental health. So, um, and then once a person comes out, uh, a, cap a part of our organization is Catholic Charities, which has an extensive uh, program of mental health services. So we're able to kind of direct people to agencies who can help them. And the, the Cuyahoga County, I want to say, has a a growingly strong pre-entry program, which I think is a tremendous benefit to us in this county. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sister, how, how much does the Ohio prison system really concentrate on education? You talked about a GED program, yes. but does the Ohio prison system in, uh, encourage it certainly does. There are programs within the, within the prison system that address issues of skill development and intellectual development. However, over the years, and you, I mean, this is just simple math, if you look at the increase in the number of um, persons that they're trying to care for and provide for, many of those programs have e either had to be eliminated. That's what made me very conscious. I serve on the Citizens Advisory Board for the prisons in this area. 
And I could hear time after time we had to eliminate this program because of funding, or this program because of funding. I thought, we could be doing something about that. And so um, the programming is getting stronger. I want to say some of the skilled programs, for example, Grafton has a, a commercial driver's license program now. They're, they have trucks out of Grafton where men can get their driver's license as commercial driver. That's a great path into employment. They've got a wonderful uh, welding program, great path. They've got a wonderful culinary skills program. Those are all really good programs, but there can be more, or there can be supplements to what they're already doing. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, actually, mine's not uh, really a foodie question. Latina, you had indicated that you already brought a passion food. You've gone to try C to the culinary program, and, and although that happened, it sounds like been a very satisfying experience, you still have this strong interest. And so, so for you going through Edmonds, it, it, like, that seems very obvious, like it's a perfect fit. Lee, did you also have a really strong interest in food that made this a good fit? Or, or did you come at it from a different angle? Well, just the eating part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, used to, I wanted to... Actually, I tried to, you know, like I had a fantasy about being a food critic because I like food, but you know, it's a little bit more involved in that, just going to eat. So uh, that was, that's basically my sense. Um, the depth of my life was with food. So until I came here. And one other question related to this, um, Latina, are you This was a bonus, a true bonus. And I also do plan on going back to Tri-C to get my associate's degree. Terrific. So once I finish with Edwards and I pay off some of the loans, I'm gonna go back down there so I can keep going. And what's the food truck cuisine? I didn't hear it. I said, what's the food truck cuisine? Soul food. All right. <laughs> Soul food. <laughs> <laughs> one question, I think it's about a lot of Thank you. 